Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, it's really good to see a lot of familiar faces in, in my webcam feed and I, I've been told you can't see me, so that's a little bit weird, but whatever, we'll roll with it. Um, so today uh, I'm presenting on managing your Windows infrastructure with Ansible, um, which has been something I've been uh, coming up to speed with on the last year or so. Uh, I am uh, Josh King. I blog at toastit.dev. I'm on Twitter at WindowsNZ. i um, a Microsoft MVP and infrastructure and operations engineer at Chocolatey. Uh, now, what are we talking about today? Uh, obviously, you know the title of the talk. Um, so broadly speaking, we're talking about infrastructure as code um, and specifically, in a Windows environment. Um, now Ansible, of course, is its own thing and you work with it using YAML and potentially Python if you wanna go down that route. Um, but I want to emphasize that you don't have to throw away your investment in learning PowerShell if you start going down the Ansible route. Um, I'm gonna cover some of the pitfalls and uh, lessons that I've learned over the last year. Um, but one thing that we won't be covering is the setup of Ansible itself. So Ansible runs on Linux, um, and that's true regardless of uh, what endpoints you're managing. Um, now, in saying that, if you do have questions about setting up Ansible, feel free to reach out to me afterwards, and we can um, I'll answer whatever questions I can. Um, so very first question that we should probably answer is, why Ansible? Uh, I mentioned we're talking uh, infrastructure as code. Broadly speaking, that can be split up. That concept can be split up into two camps. You've got your infrastructure provisioning and your configuration management. Uh, infrastructure provisioning being like your VMs, uh, virtual networks potentially, um, managing the underlying platforms that your things are running on. And configuration management is actually configuring say, services on Windows, deploy the web apps themselves, specific firewall rules. Um, in the infrastructure provisioning space, we've got uh, generic tools like Terraform and Plumi, and platform-specific tools like AWS CloudFormation and Azure ARM templates, and Bicep now, which is the icon that I've put up there. Uh, configuration management, we've got tools like Chef, Puppet, SaltStack, and the reason why you might consider Ansible is it sort of straddles those two, those two camps. It does a good enough job of infrastructure provisioning. It does a good enough job of configuration management. Um, and it means you only have to learn one tool. Um, now, yes, the other tools might do a better job in specific situations, but like I say, Ansible has been good enough for me so far. Now, a little bit of terminology just to level set against um, the PowerShell knowledge that I assume most people in the room have. Um, I've tried to map some Ansible terminology to PowerShell terminology, um, and it isn't perfect, but bear with me. So in Ansible, we've got collections. You can think of those like PowerShell modules. Um, these are effectively the distribution uh, mechanism for getting uh, your bits out there or to consume other people's bits to do things. Then just to really confuse things, Ansible then has modules, which you can think of as commandlets in PowerShell. Now, when I say commandlets, I'm specifically talking about C sharp. Um, and the term has escaped me. Um, anyway, the C sharp commands, um, compiled commands. Um, so on PowerShell side, that'll be C sharp and Ansible, that's generally Python. Then next we've got roles in Ansible, which you can think of as functions in PowerShell. These are effectively what I would consider most people that are using Ansible, that they would start creating their own roles, just like I would expect people to start creating their own functions and then bundling those into collections for reuse. And then finally, for this comparison, we've got playbooks, um, which you can think of as just script files. These are the things that you're actually running to 
um, invoke the changes that you want on your endpoint. Uh, now, Ansible is all YAML, and I wanted to chuck a quick slide up here to go through what you're going to be seeing in the demo um, outside of that, just so that it's not uh, too confusing when we get into the code and just see a whole lot of it. Um, so yeah, Ansible uses YAML, um, and it'll look a lot like this. One key thing to remember with YAML is indentation is very important. So I use a VS Code extension called Indent Rainbow to just help see that all the indents are lining up and, and they look good. Now, as for what we're actually seeing here, that this task, which is one of the steps in my playbook, um, has a collection, and I'm using the azure.az collection collection. Um, and from that, I'm using a module uh, called Azure RM resource groups, a group. group. Um, so you can infer from that that this task is going to be doing something with a resource group. Specifically here, we're creating one, but you could be um, equally updating it. You could be removing it. Um, yeah. Now, lined up against where we've specified that collection with the, uh, the module with uh, the indents, uh, those are task keywords. Um, so the top one's name, it's just giving a nice descriptor for what the task does. Um, you see this in the output when you run a playbook. And down the bottom is also delegate to. Uh, now, the task keywords tend to be instructions to Ansible itself for what, when, and how to run a task. Um, whereas anything indented underneath the reference to the module, uh, module parameters. Uh, so here, the resource group module takes name, location tags, and under tags, I'm specifying a couple of those. Um, and you can look up the documentation for a given module to see all of the parameters it would take. So resource group takes a lot, uh, but for this, we've just got that one. Next, you'll see uh, these random curly braces everywhere. Whenever you see two of them surrounding a string, that's a, ver that's a variable name. Um, so here, whatever happens to be in the variable AZ region, is going to be substituted into that uh, parameter. Now, your variables could be strings. They can be Boolean values. They can be anything, really, lists, dictionaries, um, which means I could, for example, create a variable that's all of my tags, and then I could pop that in there as well as a, as a variable. But enough slides. Let's um, give Microsoft some money. Um, Let's start over the right-hand side. So for Ansible to know what you're working with or what you want to manage, um, you have what's known as an inventory. And that starts with a hosts file. There's actually a couple of different formats this host file can be in. I'm using YAML here, um, but it can be like the old any format. Um, and there's some others. But because everything else is YAML, I just stick with YAML. Now. There's a top level group called all. This allows you to just say, um, I want to run this playbook against everything. And it'll go and find all of the hosts that are sitting, sitting under the all group. Uh, so for this, I've just got the one host. It's called Ansible Demo. Um, but then the all group can also have children groups. So in addition to my all group, I've got an Azure group. And again, just my one demo VM sitting under that. Now. For each of your hosts, for each of the endpoints that you're managing, you have host vars or host variables. These are variables specific to that one host. So this is these are the variables um, that I'm defining just for my Ansible demo VM. Uh, so in here, you can see things like Ansible is going to be connecting to it via WinRM on port 5986. Uh, at the moment, I don't actually know what the IP address is um, because the VM doesn't exist yet. Uh, and I'm specifying a Windows user and password. So when I create this VM in Azure, it's going to want a username and password. So I'm providing that here. You'll note you can see my username 
but you can't make much sense of my password. It's been encrypted using Ansible Bolt. Um, and then when we run our playbook, we provide the key to unlock that, uh, that actual value that's sitting behind that. And then we've got some other variables. Um, specifically, I give my VM a short name that I want to refer to it by. Um, and then something specific to the playbook that I'm running is I give it a description for back info. And then I need to define uh, what the environment that this is going to live in um, specifically for this VM in Azure. So I give the size, what resource group it's going to be going into, um, some network stuff. And then finally for this uh, VM specifically, I tell it, I want these chocolatey packages installed and I want these PowerShell modules installed. And these are just a list of strings that we can uh, work with. And I realize uh, this is going to take a little bit of time to actually run. So let's get that kicked off um, before I look at the other variables. Uh, so to run a playbook, there's an Ansible dash playbook command. You point it at your playbook and specifically because I've got these encrypted variables, I need to give it some way of decrypting that value. Here I'm pointing at a file. Um, you probably shouldn't do this in production, um, but also I didn't want to be providing my password at runtime just in case I uh, mistype it. So I'll kick that off and it'll carry on down the bottom there while we keep going. So a host file, um, we've talked about the host files. Now we've got two groups. And like host files, we've also got group files. So we've got two groups, we've got Azure. Um, and in here, I've specified what region I want all of my Azure resources to go into. So without specifying anything for my VM, everything's going to go into West US. Uh, what doing it at the group level allows me to do is I can change it here once and it's going to apply to everything. Uh, well, everything that runs in Azure. Um, you can override this by specifying it in the uh, host files. So if you, for whatever reason, want a specific VM running in a different region, you can override it. Um, and later in the demo, I need my IP address uh, in there. So, and I don't really want to have that in the recording. So I've just vaulted that as well. So you can't see it. And then finally, the all, uh, the all group here, I've specified my Ansible user and password. Again, you wouldn't want to do this in production, but for the sake of the demo, I've done it here. And it's also a prompt for me to talk about the fact that when Ansible connects to something, it's going to try and use the Ansible user and Ansible password variables to do that. Um, when I create my VM, though, it's going to have those Windows user and Windows password um, credentials and uh, sorry, the, my Windows user account, and it won't have this Ansible account created. So if Ansible tried to connect to that VM, uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, so I do have a different user for logging into Windows and for managing Ansible. Um, and we'll cover how I create this user. Well, now, uh, let me keep that there so we can refer to some of the variables as we go. Now, this is the playbook that I'm running at the moment. It's create, at the moment, it's creating my virtual machine up in Azure. And yes, I know I say that funny, <laughs> blame where I come from. Um, so the first thing up the top of a playbook is you uh, tell it what hosts the playbook's gonna run on. Uh, this can be a specific VM, this can be a group. So I could put all there and it would run on everything. Um, but the first thing Ansible is going to do when you start a playbook is it tries to reach out and connect to that host and gather some facts about it. Those are things like uh, what CPU the machine's got, how much memory, disks, network, all of that sort of generic stuff. But obviously, when I run this, my VM doesn't exist. So I have to tell Ansible, don't do that because it's not going to go well for you. Um, next. I'm um, dynamically creating some variables that um, that will be used throughout this playbook. So in effect, I've got a naming convention for my various resources in Azure, and they are all based on the short name. 
for the VM that I'm running against. Um, now, we talked about uh, the double curly braces being a variable. I'm piping that into the lower, I believe the term for them is filter, but effectively that's just making the characters in my short name all lowercase, mainly so that they're valid for the storage count. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these are all now variables that I can use later in the playbook. Now I'm not gonna go too in depth into this playbook because um, it's specific to Azure and then if you're using AWS or you're using VMware or you're using Hyper-V, um, it'll be different. And the more interesting stuff is under Windows. So I'll quickly run through this. Um, we've already seen the creating of the resource group, but you remember um, I've said the VM doesn't exist and we're running this against the VM that doesn't exist. So what delegate two does is it says, ignore what uh, machine I'm trying to manage, run this here. So I'm saying run it localhost, so it'll run on my Ansible box. Um, you could say run this on a separate machine. So for example, if you need, if you've got a monitoring system that you need to get some something from in order to register this machine that you're creating into that, you can say, hey, run this task, but run it on that monitoring system to get what you need. Um, and then of course, setting up in a, a thing in Azure, you need a whole bunch of other stuff. So we're gonna create a storage account, then a virtual network, then a subnet, and then a public IP address. Now the difference with the public IP address is now we see this register keyword. What that does is says, whatever the output of this module, register it into this variable. So we're now dynamically creating a variable based on the output of a, of a given module. And what we use that for is if I scroll up, I now have the IP address for my Azure VM because this next task here goes and takes the output from that variable finds the IP address and the specific place where that was found I got from the documentation because it wasn't um, right up against the actual uh, variable, which was annoying. Um, but what I do with that is I go and use this built-in module to say, find the line in the host files that matches Ansible host and change it to what we now know to be the value um, what we now know the IP address to be. Now, of course, I'm going to need that in a moment. I will copy that while we're there so I don't forget. Um, now, that's going to help for future runs. Um, but for this run, um, Ansible still thinks my IP address is my local loopback. So I use the set fact uh, module to go and override whatever it currently thinks Ansible host is with that same IP address. Um, and that will allow us to connect to the VM in a moment. So um, now Ansible is using WinRM, will be using WinRM to manage this VM. So when I create my security group, um, I'm also adding a couple of rules there. So I'm telling it open WinRM to my IP, which I've hidden away, um, and open RDP. And that's just so I can jump on the box and show you the result of what we do. Uh, then finally we start creating our NIC and then with everything we've created we uh, spin up the VM itself so that's using all the various things that we've just created including our win user and password for our admin user um, and the only thing that takes a bit of uh, investigation here is the image um, so I use the Azure RM PowerShell module to go and inspect what images are, are available and specifically what SKU I needed because um, looking through the Azure marketplace, it wasn't actually that obvious. But now that I have it, I know that I can just change that to 2019 if I want a 2019 box instead of a 2022 box. Now, you know, out of the box, a Windows machine isn't going to accept WinRM connections. Um, you'd normally have to jump on it and run something like uh, WinRM quick config, if I remember right. Um, so in order to open up that, I run a script on there using a custom script extension. 
Um, and side note here, I like how AWS does this better. You can actually specify it when you're creating the VM that you want to run a file, but that's an aside. Um, now Ansible itself on GitHub hosts a script you can run called configure remoting for Ansible. Um, it does the job really well, so I just use that. Um, now with the script extension, I tell it, I point the file URL to that on to that script on GitHub, and then we just run PowerShell pointing at that file. So it's going to download and run it from the same file, uh, the same directory. So um, you don't need to worry about trying to find the file. Then right at the end, we're going to want to connect to this VM to create our actual Ansible user. Um, and so I need to know what the Ansible user and password that I want to be are. And I'm going to put these into some temporary variables just so that I have them available. And then what I'm going to do is, just in case things are still happening, I wait for the connection to become available um, over WinRM. But I use the vars keyword here to override um, how it's connecting, or what username and password it's using. So I say, hey, for the Ansible user, use the win password that you've just created, and for the pa uh, sorry, win user, and same Ansible password, win password. And then finally, we can go and create our dedicated Ansible user. Um, so those temporary variables I created up above, I use those to specify that I want uh, a user with that password. It's going into the administrators group, user can't change password, password never changes. And again, same as up here, we're creating that user, but it doesn't yet exist. So I need to override the Ansible user and password again. Now, that finished running, and we get this output from Ansible. Anything that's uh, yellow and says changed means you asked me to put something in a state. It wasn't in that state, and now it is. Um, it could also come back failed, obviously meaning there was an issue. If it's green, it either means it was already in the state you expected or there was nothing for it to, the task in and of itself never changes anything. So for example, when I'm setting facts, that's never a change, um, so it comes back green. Uh, and then at the end, you get your nice recap of, this is what I was targeting and this is how many of the tasks uh, change something and the overall, okay, now one thing to note, these don't add up. This is a subset of this. Um, on some of my longer playbooks, I've gotten confused by that in the past and thought it was almost double the length of what it actually was. Um, and while I've got this open, I'll start the next one while we start talking about it, just in the interest of time. So we've got our VM. Uh, our Azure VM created that's running up in Azure now. Now we need to actually configure the box. So let me start running my Windows playbook. And let's have a look at it. So this is my playbook where we're actually going to start setting up the VM, how I'm going to be using it. Um, starts the same, we specify what host we're targeting. But this time, because the host exists and the account we're using to connect to it exists, we can go and gather facts right off the bat. So um, you don't actually need to tell it to gather facts if you want it to get, want it to do that. But just for consistency, I like to keep it in there. Now, on all of my Windows boxes, I like to make sure the host name is what I expect it to be. So I happen to know with Azure, when you create a VM and you specify a name, that's going to be already set in the operating system. But by putting that in my playbook, then I can guarantee that that's the case. Um, and here we're using when host name from the, the ansible.windows collection. Um, next, set up a uh, set my time zone. Um, so of course I'm from down here in New Zealand. Um, some of the team might be in the UK, some of the team might be in the States. Um, so having a consistent time zone across everyone really helps. Um, and even though I know, again, Azure is going to, uh, by default, set my machine into UTC, by configuring it here, I know that it's going to be the case. Uh, and here, note that 
it's the win time zone module, but this one, instead of being ansible.windows, is community.windows. So for most of your Windows stuff, you're going to be using those two command, uh, those two collections, um, Ansible Windows and Community Windows. Now, uh, for the sake of demonstration, what I want to do is create, uh, well, set up back info, um, which is similar to BG info, where it puts information on the wallpaper, except it's centered and looks really nice, and I prefer it personally. Um, and that's a hill I'm willing to die on. Uh, so here we creating uh, uh, we're using win file and you'll note that there's state here. So with most modules, there's an implied state of present, which just means make sure this thing is there. The inverse of that is absent, which will remove something. Um, now by default, win file is going to create files. So in order to get it to create directories, you set the state to directory. That's just how this particular module does that. Um, so we create the file and then I'm going to drop, uh, sorry, we create the directory and then I'm gonna drop two files on disk. Uh, the first being backinfo.exe itself. And the second is a bitmap that it's gonna use for the wallpaper on my VM. Um, I've chosen a nice generic royalty free image um, that shouldn't get anyone in trouble. Uh, now, these files, I'm specifying them just by name, and they live under a files directory relative to my playbooks. Um, so here I've got uh, the backinfo, exe, and the bitmap. Cool. So all that's going to do is go, here's some files, copy them via the WinRM connection to the remote machine. Now, backinfo also needs a configuration any file. And you'll notice it's not in my files thing. And also I'm not using WinCopy, I'm using WinTemplate. So this then lives under my templates directory um, with a J2 extension. Now that's optional, um, but it's the convention for this because the templates are technically Ginger 2 templates. Um, and you'll see when we specify the destination for where it's going, you just drop the J2 off because it, at the other end, it's just the any file or it's just the text file or it's just the config file or whatever you're doing. Um, now, if we look at that file, this all at first glance looks like just a standard uh, any text file until we scroll down a bit and we can see that I've got a variable in the text file. So when you run the template uh, command module, it's going to substitute any variables that are in there and the resulting file will be the result of that substitution. Now where Ginger 2 gets really powerful is you can put if statements and loops and all sorts of stuff in there and dynamically create your files. And um, frankly, templates are, in my opinion, one of the most powerful things around this. And I'm a little upset that I couldn't dive into them further. Um, but we've got a lot more to cover. So um, I will talk about another use case at the end of the demo though. Uh, so that's gonna pop my configuration file on disk. And then finally, because I need it to actually run when someone logs in, I'm gonna drop a shortcut using the win shortcut module into the startup directory. All right, that's back info. Now onto some of the more serious stuff. Um, and our first time actually using PowerShell. Um, and ironically, it's to disable PowerShell. Um, but no, seriously, uh, this is disabling uh, PowerShell v2 on my box so that people can't do a downgrade attack and get around my transcription and stuff. Um, and what I try and do, well, actually, rewind that a bit. There's a few different ways of running PowerShell on the end machine, uh, on the target machine using Ansible. I've standardized on using the Win PowerShell module. And that's mainly because one, it's worked really well for me, but two, you get this uh, automatic variable called Ansible, which allows you to customize um, the feedback from your script back to Ansible. Um, and whenever I'm running PowerShell, I try and keep it item potent. So, if I don't need to make a change, I don't make a change, and I report back to Ansible that nothing changed. Uh, 
so for this PowerShell one, I go and get the optional feature for PowerShell V2. If it's enabled, go and disable it. And then tell Ansible via the automatic variable that changed is equal to true. Uh, if it wasn't enabled, don't disable anything because it already is disabled and tell Ansible nothing changed. Now, this variable also has a dot failed on it, which allows you to um, report back to Ansible that obviously the task failed. Um, and there is a dot result or dot results, I don't remember offhand, um, that allows you to provide stuff back to Ansible. So it could be strings, can be Boolean values, can be PS custom object actually works surprisingly well. Um, but then you can register that output and use it in other, other steps, other tasks. Uh, same deal here for the NuGet provider. So we're going to install some PowerShell modules in a second. And as you'll know, with a brand new Windows box, uh, it's not going to install PowerShell modules. It'll complain about the NuGet provider not being there. Um, so again, we go and see if it's installed. If it isn't, we install it and tell Ansible something changed. And if it's not, uh, uh, sorry. And if it is installed, we don't do anything and we tell Ansible nothing changed. Sure. I thought we were going to 11. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you. You just about gave me a heart attack. <laughs> okay. Now my completely unbiased, um, we need to install some chocolatey packages. Um, so in my vars, we've got a list of chocolatey packages that I want to install. So I want PowerShell Core, I want 7-zip, Sysmon, um, and I've stripped out setting up Sysmon, but that's obviously something you can do, and Notepad++. So I've got that as required chocolate packages. Um, and we're using the, the mouthful, <laughs> sorry, the mouthful of a command called chocolatey.choco.winchocolatey. Um, and I even screwed that up, but <laughs> um, but so in order to loop through this, um, now there's a couple of ways you can do this, but how I've done it here is you can specify the loop keyword pointed at your variable. And by default, when you loop on something in Ansible, it's going to use the automatic variable item, similar to like an... Um, PowerShell where you got the dollar underscore, that sort of thing. But you can lo use loop control to tell it actually, rather than item, I want my variable to be called chocolate package. So then under win chocolatey, I say, yep, whatever the current item in the loop is, go and install that. And finally, there's a new keyword here called when, and that tells Ansible what condition, under what condition this task should run. And here it's saying, only run this task if this variable is defined. So without changing this playbook, I could go and remove that from my host files and it would just skip this task. It wouldn't error and saying, hey, this thing isn't there, blah, blah, blah. Just skip it. And then very much the same thing for PowerShell, um, except that my loop var is PS module instead of chocolate package, obviously. Um, and my state has changed. So for chocolatey packages, I've said present, which just means make sure a version of the package is installed. I don't care what version, just install whatever the latest is at the time. But if I rerun this, it's not going to try and upgrade anything. With the PowerShell modules, I've said latest, which means whenever I run this, check the PowerShell gallery if there's an update, install it. Um, and to be fair, I would probably have these both as latest, but... Um, I did want to show that difference. Um, now, the final task in this uh, playbook is including more tasks. So I, I've split out some of the tasks from this that have the possibility of growing arms and legs. So um, you could be setting hundreds of local group policies and they would just pollute this task file. 
you might also want to call um, this set of tasks from multiple playbooks so you can sort of compartmentalize them and uh, reuse them. Uh, so I use the include tasks module or plugin, whatever it technically is. Um, and unfortunately, unlike the copy and template thing, it doesn't actually know what directory to look under. So I have to tell it, hey, this is under my tasks directory. Um, and then I just point at the YAML file. So in here, um, effectively what this does is reads in the file and then just starts executing it at the time when it gets to it. Uh, so the first thing in here is I ensure that I have the policy file editor installed because that's what I'm using to manage my group policies. And you'll notice that's already one of my required PowerShell modules. Um, so I expect this to already be on my box, but because I could reuse this task file, I'm putting it there anyway so that I know I can reuse this task file without relying on the parent one that I've created in this case. Um, and just to demo um, actually setting a group variable, uh, a GPO, um, I'm turning off the ability to use the pin for sign-in. Um, and this all looks gnarly, but it's effectively just how you use uh, set policy file entry. Um, and again, I'm getting the current policy value. And if it's not what I expect, uh, if it's not what I expect, we change it and then change, change, change it to changed. Um, and I do another one there where I turn off notifications on the lock screen. Those are just two examples that I plucked out, but of course you can do a hell of a lot more. And I have a link to where you can find all of these values if you need to go down this path. Now, a uh, keyword here that is new is notify. Uh, no, and it's notifying uh, run GP update. We can see that as a handler down the bottom of my playbook. And it's listening on a matching string. Um, and so effectively what a handler is, is it's something that conditionally runs if a task in the actual playbook has told it to. Um, and it'll run once. And I believe if you've got multiple handlers, it's a stack. So the last one to be called will run first. So these are handy, for example, if you change a config file and need to restart the service or um, the box needs to be restarted or something like that. Um, and you have multiple tasks that could potentially need it because otherwise you could just do a win statement or something like that to do it in the playbook itself. Okay, so our Windows box has been configured. Um, as I said, the host name's already correct, UTC's already set, bunch of stuff changed. We can see chocolatey installed and there's output here saying, Chocolatey wasn't actually on the system, so I've installed it. So that's just a feature of how the Chocolatey module works. Um, you'll note I never actually said anywhere to install Chocolatey. Um, so it just does it for you. I installed the PowerShell modules. And like I said, uh, because PS File Editor was installed up here, this returned OK because it's already installed when it got to that point. And then at the end, after my last task, it ran the handler to uh, run a GP update. Now, let's quickly see the output of that. Uh, the result of that. And I would mention that the fact that I can RDP to it means that my security group worked, but also the fact that I can win RM onto it means my security group worked as well, so I shouldn't be too surprised. Um, I probably could have gone for a bigger VM to make this bit a bit quicker. While it's loading, I will say I did have to cut some content from this demo. Um, so if you go and grab my demo code um, at the end, there's some extra stuff in there. Um, I think the main thing that came out was setting firewall uh, rules, which was its own task file as well. All right, so our back info worked uh, with that uh, description that we substituted into the config file 
using a variable. Uh, if I look here, I can see notepads installed, which means chocolatey ran. Uh, well, there's a different user. That'll learn me. All right, and I know burnt toast installed, so I should just be able to blindly go and run toast and it will pop something up. Cool. And should have a bunch of stuff installed via chocolatey. Cool. So all of that worked. Nice. Um, so effectively, we have gone from nothing <laughs> um, to we created our entire environment in Azure and started configuring the box. Obviously, your uh, Windows configuration from there can grow arms and legs. Um, some key takeaways. First thing is you're going to need to learn to love YAML. Um, and I say that with my tongue in cheek because no one loves YAML. Um, but the key thing to remember is indentation. I've lost hours to me accidentally indenting something wrong and it being a real simple fix at the end. Um, that extension that colorizes the indents really helps with that as well. Um, that's something I only came across later in my Ansible journey. Um, you do need a WinRM connection between your Ansible host and your Windows endpoints. So for this demo, I created a uh, opened up WinRM between my public IP and my resource in Azure. Don't think that means that you have to individually open up WinRM to all of your remote resources. You could put a jump box in that you run Ansible from that, or you could use Tower. Uh, AWX, something like that, in the environment that you're managing. Uh, and also SSH is possible, uh, but it's experimental. I haven't even looked at it yet because WinRM's just worked for me um, in my environments. Um, and you'll also run into the fact that Ansible tends to be Linux first, which is a pain. Um, don't let that dissuade you though, but I would say, uh, make sure you put Windows in any Google search terms just to make sure you end up on the right docs because um, the error messages aren't always too helpful to tell you, hey, dummy, you're running the Linux version of this thing on a Windows box. You generally get cryptic uh, either WinRM or uh, Python errors. Um, and you'll notice... Um, Sometimes I was specifying the full collection name and module, and other times I was just collect, uh, just specifying the module name. For example, um, instead of ansible.windows.wincopy, it was just wincopy. Um, some commands will only work with the shortened version. Other commands will work with just the long. Yeah, there I say. Um, other commands will only work when the full command is specified. I believe it's something to do with different versions being available for different versions of Ansible and somehow them both ending up on the box. Um, but just know if you run into an error, try changing that name if the error doesn't sort of point to, hey, that file already exists and you're trying to do something with it or you know something to that effect. A um, couple more. There are a lot of available collections out there, but you will find gaps really quickly. Um, so don't be shy about leveraging your PowerShell knowledge to fill those gaps. You can also run DSC um, resources via Ansible. Um, so if you're okay with that, you can use those as well. Um, when you do go for PowerShell, aim for item potence. Um, and for more on that, my colleague, James Ruskin, is actually delivering a talk right now called Item Potence Isn't a Dirty Word. Um, so thanks for coming to this talk, but make sure you check out that recording uh, when it's available. Um, as always, same as with your PowerShell, same with everything, parameterize things, use variables, make sure your, uh, your code is reusable. Um, and Ginger 2 templates are really powerful. Um, I don't think I can get into that example, but hit me up on Slack if, uh, if you're interested in hearing about uh, reusing templates. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Um,
this slide deck and my demo code as well as some bonuses and resource links are available at toast it, uh, sorry, toast.click slash summit 2022. Um, and we don't have time for questions, unfortunately, but um, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at windowsnz or I'm on the event Slack as well. So grab me there. Um, and thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.